Chapter 27 Why This Waste It was only a few months after we had opened our new Tanzania program. I was back at Abayat in the Sudan. I was standing by the trees missionaries had planted there over a quarter of a century before. The only trees visible in the vast Dinka plain. But there were no mission houses. The place where I'd proposed to Phyllis had disappeared. It was no dream. Thirteen years had passed since missions had been expelled. The station had been laid waste. The outline of the old airstrip was hardly discernible through the high grass. Surrounding Dinka or Arab tradesmen had taken all the bricks and building materials from the mission houses. There were only a few crumbling foundations and the remains of a small clinic and little Eileen's grave. A few Dinkas came by. Are the missionaries coming back? they asked. There's no one to treat us when we are sick or hurt. I had driven with Bob Gordon and three missionaries from Malakal to Abayat on another survey. We'd been allowed back into southern Sudan to assess some of the great needs of the Upper Nile province. SIM had a new permission to set up a chain of primary health care clinics among the Dinka and Maban. An air service was again going to be vital to support the project. We were glad to be asked to help. Wherever we went, much had changed. Abayat's destruction was typical. The difficulties of travel hadn't changed, however. It was the dry season, and we could go overland, but it was hard going. We had a Toyota and a four-wheel drive Land Rover. Even flat out, neither of them was able to do much more than 25 miles an hour because of the bone-shaking roughness of the cracked cotton soil trails. There were few Dinka Christians in the Abayat area. The independent Dinka had largely ignored the teaching of missionaries. They had been decimated by fighting, by diseases such as cholera, and especially by Kalazar. In one village, a few months before we arrived, three quarters of the children and a third of the adults had died of it. Another had only one child left alive. Drought and famine added to the problems. A hard drive from Abayet eastwards across the Dinka Plain to Doro brought us to other scenes which, for me, evoked further nostalgic memories. I remembered the Christmas evening twenty-five years before, when, with a few missionaries, I had walked back there from one of the outlying villages. The tropical moon had lit up the palm trees as we walked and sang, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. The stars were so bright that I felt I was walking into a Christmas card picture of Bethlehem itself. Doro was nothing like that now in the hot light of day. The little round African tukul where I'd lived as a bachelor and which had served as daytime quarters for Phyllis and me soon after our marriage was still there. The decrepit mission house, the veranda of which we'd shared with Steve and Kay Stevens, had survived as well, though more decrepit and lizard-haunted than ever. A giant baobab tree in the centre of the station had grown even bigger. It looked like a grotesque ogre, with a dozen branches sprouting from its squat trunk, like angry arms raised in frustration at the hurt of the land and its people. Doro proved more encouraging than Abayat, however. Though bush and trees had encroached on the airstrip, it could soon be operational again. And though the number of Maban Christians wasn't large, they were still meeting there, even after years of isolation. There was no church building. The church seats were rows of long tree trunks, lodged horizontally in the forks of short, Y-shaped stumps, set in a clearing near the baobab tree. That Sunday... We worshipped outdoors with the Mabans, one of their elders leading the service. We visited distant villages, going as far as we could in our Land Rover and then continuing on foot through the tall grasses. The villagers welcomed us and we conferred with their elders. 
They wanted medical help. They wanted teaching. They would clear an airstrip. On the way back towards Doro, we met a young Maban woman, bright-faced and smiling. She had not seen missionaries since she was a child. Let me sing to you, she said. She started a hymn in Maban that was familiar to us all. The light of God's love had not died away. When I met one of our faithful Sudanese workers from Malakal, I asked what had happened to him since we'd left there. His story was only too like that of many others. He'd had to go into hiding. His wife had become ill with malaria. She'd been admitted to hospital in Malakal and died. His three children, Rebecca, John and Priscilla, named after ours, had died too. I thought of our own three children, alive and well, now with children of their own. The civil war had gripped southern Sudan for many years. Half a million southerners had hidden in the bush. Over a quarter of a million had fled to surrounding countries. Thousands had been killed. The whole administrative infrastructure set up by the British colonial administrators had been lost. Hunger and disease were rife. Eventually, Emperor Haile Selassie, before he was deposed, and others, had mediated in the Sudan dispute. A peace accord had been signed in Addis Ababa between the leaders of the North and South, with a degree of federal autonomy conceded to the Southerners. This accord had now reopened the country to relief work, though not to other traditional mission activities. In addition to the new health care that SIM was able to start in the Upper Nile province, a totally new relief organization was formed, with its operating base much further south, at Juba. It was called ACROSS, Africa Committee for the Rehabilitation of Southern Sudan. Initially, MAF and three other missions were involved, other agencies joining later. ACROSS did outstanding work over the following years. It set up dispensaries, reopened and staffed hospitals, and ran urgently needed agricultural, relief, rehabilitation, and development programs. Schools were opened as well. I often travelled with ACROSS staff, visiting the southernmost provinces of Sudan to see the work. Once, when we stopped our Land Rover on a rough trail to greet local people, a large crowd of teenage dinkers gathered round. Why were they gazing at us so intently? Suddenly I realized this whole generation had grown up hidden in the bush. They'd heard of white people from their parents, but we were the first they'd ever seen. Again, it took me back to our earliest visits to some of Africa's remotest areas, thirty years before. The clock had been turned back further than I'd realized. Drink of the Nile, and you'll always come back to it again. The Arab proverb was certainly true of some in MAF. Needing experienced pioneers to reopen our Sudan program, I asked Alistair MacDonald to be the project manager. He and Margaret came back to Malakal for two years to see the work started, renting an Arab merchant's house almost in the shadow of the mosque. Back too came other Sudan veterans. Vern and Lorraine Sycamore, followed by Hugh and Norma Beck. We'd have liked to buy back our original base in Malakal, but the army did not want to part with it. Instead, the provincial government granted us a plot on the edge of town, and we had to start again from scratch to build a new base. It took more than two years. With the desperately slow arrival of building materials, interruptions from the rains, and the general difficulties of building on cotton soil. In contrast, we were able to reoccupy our old hangar very quickly. The governor, glad to see us back, soon had it cleared out. As the program built up, Keith and Lynn Jones joined in, and later Nigel and Nicola Riley. The Becks and then the Sycamores returned to East Africa. We reopened a number of the old airstrips for SIM and added new ones. The mission established six clinics staffed by nurses 
stretching across the Upper Nile province from the Dinka area by the river to Maban country to the east. A doctor was stationed at Malut, the main base of the primary health care project. At Abayat, the nurses' house and health care center were built on the foundations of the earlier dwellings. Further south, in the former American mission area, our planes flew once again to Nasa and Akobo, helping the Sudanese church leaders. There were both Nua and Anuak Christians at Akobo. At Nasa, the Nua church was strong, with some tireless evangelists reaching out to neighboring areas. In all, we served seven different church, mission, and relief agency groups, as well as flying for the provincial government itself. With two planes and three pilots, we were as busy as we had ever been in the Sudan. We're grounded. The northern government has suspended our operating permit, Keith Jones wrote to us sadly in August 1982. Our base had been completed, with three good houses and a much better hangar. We were ready to serve the region more effectively than ever before. Why were we being stopped again? I flew with one of our MAF board members to see the civil aviation authorities in Khartoum. An aviation lawyer of international reputation, well known to the civil aviation department, came to and did his utmost for us, all in vain. We were allowed to continue to operate, but only under crippling restrictions. Tension was obviously rising. The conflict in the Sudan escalated once more. The uneasy peace accord shattered, and fighting broke out again. Our new MAF houses at Malakal were damaged by gunfire. General Nameri's government collapsed, unable to stabilize the rapidly deteriorating economy or end the animosities between North and South. Strong Islamic elements in the North sought control, and bitter civil war swept down on the South once more. I made a final visit to the Sudan to talk with missions, churches, and our MAF staff. We decided we had to close down our operation and once more withdraw. We'd been back in the Sudan only seven years. Had it all been fruitless? Why this waste? asked Roger Fothergill in the title of an article he sent us at the time. As our last pilot in the Sudan before it was closed, he echoed the words of the questioning disciples when Mary of Bethany poured her expensive perfume over Jesus' feet. We don't know why this waste, Roger wrote. We have done all we can to serve Sudan, though sometimes we feel like Isaiah when he said, We have labored to no purpose and have spent our strength in vain. Amid the spiritual battle, there will be wastage. It is part and parcel of the task. Much has been achieved. Christian work has been greatly encouraged. Our brothers in the National Church have expressed their gratitude to us many times. During those seven years, the small Maban church at Doro had grown encouragingly. I well remember the happy face of one of the Doro pastors. Maban Christians had gone out from village to village and more than a dozen other congregations had been established. Much more of the Bible was translated into their language. In the Shali area, 250 Uduks had been baptized, an amazing number for the tribe which years ago an anthropologist had described as one of the most primitive in Africa. Even among the resistant Dinkas, an unusual spiritual hunger had appeared in some areas. The Gideon Bible School had been established alongside the growing church at Malut. The faithful pastor Gideon, who had been shot and thrown into the Nile, had not been forgotten, nor had his work been extinguished. The school trained more than a dozen pastors and evangelists from among the Dinka, Maban, Uduk, and other tribes in the region. Roger Fothergill was right. Much had been achieved. Further south, in Equatoria province, 
the work of a cross carried on for another five years, even amidst much fighting and guerrilla activity. Thousands were helped, including many Ugandan refugees who had fled across the border into the Sudan from their own war-torn country. As a member of the Across Board, I continued to visit southern Sudan and kept a close touch with what went on there. The leader of Across at this time was Charles Wilson, whom I came to know well during my fifteen years' involvement with their work. His extensive experience with Across and with the many different nationalities involved was one day to prove invaluable to MAF.